Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where our goal is to help you find health and community through movement. I'm Molly Herford, a writer, coach, and yoga teacher. And I'm Peter Glassford, an endurance coach and kinesiologist. Every week, we're talking to athletes and experts who can help you lead your best active, adventurous life. Whether you're a gravel racer, a marathon runner, or you just got out on your first bike ride yesterday, we're here cheering you on. You can also visit us online at consummateathlete.com for coaching information and training tips, nutrition advice, yoga flows, bike skills, and more. And now, let's get into this week's episode. Hello, hello. Welcome back to another episode of the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how are you feeling? I'm good. Yeah, it's, summer is rolling along quickly, it seems. They, they go quicker, they say, with time. Oh, boy. Uh, you had a long ride this morning. Yeah, we were at another long uh, weekend of riding here. I'm trying to get fitness up as racing seems like it's returning here to Ontario, hopefully. So trying to, as I see that in the distance here, trying to ramp up the uh, work ethic. So medium results, I think, so far, but we're, we're trying. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, and we're going to be talking about sort of that return to racing later in this episode. Mm-hmm. You, uh, you wrote a post, though. You wanted to start with this, this post about taking time off and fear thereof. Yes, I did. So I wrote a post, and I don't know if I'm the only one experiencing some of these feelings, but I, I don't think I'm the only one. No, I think most athletes are, are terrified of taking time off. Yeah, so I've had sort of two different experiences in the last couple months with time off. Uh, after my 100K run a couple months ago, I had 10 days off in my schedule. Like, that was pre-planned. That was, you know, like, set in stone. And this is often in terms of not running. Sometimes it's, it's you know, we can take different type of off periods. So you were actually not running. Yes. So no running. Like, I still walked and, like, did a little bit of spinning. But for the most part, I actually took the time off. I was pretty, right. like, So it was almost chill. like a, a mid-season break or a transition period, mm-hmm. we might call that. Yeah. And I was scared to death about taking 10 days off from doing like any real training, not because I was worried about losing my fitness. I was actually much more worried about losing my drive to maintain my fitness. So I think as like a former non-athletic kid, like, you know, I came to sport much later in life. Anyone who knows me knows I like couldn't run a mile till I was 21, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's always this voice in the back of my head that thinks that at some point I'm just going to wake up and just not want to do this anymore. Like just be done with the whole running, riding, everything thing. Um, So there's always just that kind of like gnawing fear that if I take the time off, I just won't even want to get back to it. Mm. So that's actually like what freaked me out with the planned time off. Um, and you know, obviously I came back, I was fine. It was all good. Um, I, I don't really have any basis for why I was worried about that. I think we get very stuck in the moment, right? We look at everything as like a day to day, hour to hour mm-hmm. concept, right? Whereas in your case, it's yes, you came to it late, but I mean, you've been training in, in this like most recent where you've been doing ultra running and, you know, more than cycling. That's probably three years of time where you've been, tr- you know, running on most days. So if you can zoom out, and look at an off day, an off, you know, whatever, an off week, an off month, you know, an off season. It's such a small, you know, brick in the wall, if you will, of of this, you know, tapestry, this this fireplace you're building out of bricks, right? Another brick in the wall, this <laughs> the oh famous boy. song might say, maybe mixing metaphors. But that's, say, that's the idea, right, is if you zoom out, you know, you have this rhythm of running this, you know, routine, this fitness, this whatever, right? It, it's a very big well, pile you've created. Yeah, right? and not to mention, like, most of my good friends are, are runners or, or cyclists. So my worst case scenario is even if I was like, ah, I'm overrunning, I'd have a lot of cyclists that are like, great, let's start going riding again together. Like, my entire, like, the majority of my social network is made up of active people. So I think I'm pretty locked into the active lifestyle. So the, the social elements there. Yeah. And, and, and I think, you know, fitness is probably where I see more people being concerned. I don't know that they, most people would verbalize it as that routine or the habit as much. That might be certainly part of it, but it's this fear that you're going to let that fitness number and training peaks drop or the actual fitness for the task drop. And I, I don't know, I think that's like, you sort of have to, right. It, it can't, stay at a peak right that is the nature there that is the peak right it it went up and then it went down Uh, and hopefully it was a glorious peak while you were there right but that's that's i think the mistake is we try and keep it the steady and what does steady like steady would be called a plateau 
exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's, that's what people talk about when they're talking about like racing weight, which, you know, is not a topic that I really want to even touch, but you know, when you look at pro cyclists and stuff, very rarely are they staying at that, the Tour de France guys are not staying at that weight year round, right? Like they're going up, they're going down. Fitness is the exact same situation ebbs and flows with the season Mm -hmm. so anyway that was that first time off was much i i would say i was much more worried about like my mental return like would i want to come back would i be excited about it you know spoiler alert i was it's all good and then this last you know chunk of time off of running after we got back from la cloche because of my my it band i was actually more scared about will i ever be able to run again which i think is just, you know, every runner or cyclist's fear whenever there's an injury, no matter how minor. Like, I mean, it's not like at any point I couldn't walk. I could walk very well. It was not a, well, except maybe that first day when we got back. That was not great. But after that, I was totally fine. I could walk fine. But I still had this, like, feeling in the back of my brain that was just like, oh, God, what if this is forever? Again, spoiler alert, it's not. Um, and in that case, it actually was, I think, harder to not go out for runs just to just to test it, just to like see how it's going. Mm-hmm. Just, just give it a try. Um, so I worked really hard to stay away from running until now. And I, I'd say now I'm actually very like nervous and tentative, like building it back. And I'm trying to kind of almost get over that fear because now when I'm running, I'm thinking so hard about how my knee feels that I think I'm actually like manifesting yeah, it could be little little niggles in it. So I'm trying to not do that. Um, yeah. So anyway, I wrote about that over on consummateathlete.com. But yay, I ran eight miles today, which you know is normally like my super easy run, and today it was my week's long run. And you know what? It felt just fine. Hmm. Yeah, you're building back up, right? Yes. So it's... But in other like interesting uh, mental hurdles, I had gotten an email from my physio saying, oh, I have a a slot open on Monday. And I almost didn't take it because I was like, you know what? I'm back to running now. I'm good. I'm fine. Like, done. Uh, And then I kind of slapped myself a little bit there. And I was like, nope, nope. This is how you get in trouble. This is what happens. So booked that. Okay. Pretty happy, yeah. All right, well, that's, I think, important, right? We sort of try and get stronger as you start building things back up and, and you now have time before the next the next things. And I think the big thing is, yeah, like kind of continuing that, like you've done the injury, like you've you've done the rehab, and as soon as you get back to it, I think too many of us, and I've definitely been guilty of it, like as soon as things kind of are like back to normal-ish, we're just, we're done with the physical therapy exercises that we're supposed to do. You know, we're not going to the physio or the massage or the Cairo or whatever. Like, well, or we don't build back up. We try and rush back and prove that, you know, we didn't lose the fitness. And, and I think that's often the mistake, right? Dan Cleather was on and he talked about this idea of adaptation capacity or adaptive capacity, I should say. And, and it's this idea that, you know, when you're at your peak, he was saying, you know, you actually don't have any adaptive capacity. You're as fit as you can possibly get. And so part of the reason we take time off is so that we can recover some of this adaptive capacity. Yes, fitness has decreased, but we now have more energy, you could think about it, or or motivation, right? Usually if you've peaked well, you're pretty much at the end of your rope as far as what you're willing to do, right? You probably don't want to bike uh, very much, right? Um, so you're, you're trying to recover that by taking the time off. And so as we start back, we want to be careful that we don't just, you know, fire hose the whole thing and, you know, just blow through all that adaptive capacity we want to inch our way back up yeah and even thinking a few months down the line you know like okay knee is feeling good right now but if i just go right back to my old habits and don't keep doing my my clamshells and you know stretching my calves and working on you know just overall strength and stuff like i'm gonna be right back to this situation in six months so everyone listening can hold me accountable to that if in like six Mm -hmm. months i'm like oh my knee went out again Someone just hit me up on Instagram and be like, did you do your physical therapy exercises? Yeah, it could be. I mean, sometimes just even easing back in and, and not going immediately back to super long distance with running can be a part of it. But it could also be that your knee will always be, you know, something has to break at some point. Well, and I think it's, yeah, I mean, it's it's trail running. You're, you're going to, stuff's going to happen, but we're, we're doing the best to 
prevent and avoid it getting bad. Okay. Well, so. that's a post anyhow on the site. Yep. Uh, we were going to do some listener questions. That seemed popular episodes. So if you do have listener questions that you'd like to submit, feel free to do that at the contact page on consummateathlete.com or via Instagram. You can reach it to either Molly or myself or the Consummate Athlete account. Uh, anything else? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's about it. Let's get into our couple questions we have here. I'm going to start with our, our shorter answer one, which is just about filtering water for a long run. Okay. So we had someone, a runner, who's looking to do an unsupported run on a rail trail around 100 kilometers. Um, and he had heard our La Cloche, po- or La Cloche podcast episode a couple weeks ago talking about that 80-ish K uh, trail that we did. And, you know, he's got some creeks and ponds alongside the trail, so he's hoping to filter water from those. Um, and he won't be carrying like a huge filtration thing with him, obviously. So he wanted to know sort of what our thoughts were on that. I would say, you know, since we're talking about creeks and we're talking about ponds and we're, you know, we're on a rail trail. So I'm assuming we're, you know, probably not in the middle of like northern Ontario where apparently we have some of the world's purest water I recently read. Yeah, I guess for now, anyhow. Yeah. Uh, at the moment, um, you know. I would say I would probably be definitely doubling up on my filtration efforts. I, we use the Katadin filter and, you know, you can get a liter or a half liter version of that. So we normally would just filter water through that into our packs, um, but then actually also put in the aqua tabs. So they're like iodine based tabs that sit yeah, there. Yeah, there's for, different ones. There's like iodine and there's a more of a chloride, chlorine type one, I think. And yeah. A sodium based one, I think, as well. Yeah, so they go in for 30 minutes and sort of kill off anything else. I like that because it's sort of, you know, the catadin says that it, it covers pretty much everything, but I sort of like that just extra. I think it's everything except for the like Giardia and the couple other ones that you recognize is like, hey, I didn't really want that either. But uh, hang on a second. Yeah, and so I I'll put a link in the reference. You can look it up. Alex uh, Singh had a great article in Outside about filtering water and the different ways you can go about it, right? And I, I think there's a bit of risk tolerance. There's a bit of how much are you willing to carry, and there's a bit of where are you, right? So he talks about being up in northern Ontario, where I guess you know some of this risk of this these smaller particles is not as high, and where you might get away with some of these. Uh, we call them physical filters, but again, something like this catadin one where you sort of just start pressuring it through a, a filter of, of sorts, right? Versus an actual chemical or maybe a UV or something like this. So I think the the tabs are nice because they're very, very small. So as long as you can deal with any of the particles in the water or the water looking a little off, you could probably just go away, you know, and do these these tablets and you'd be safe. It just, it might not be the tastiest water. Might it might be not be kind of gross. Yeah, gross looking. Whereas if you use this physical filter and then your discretion, if you also use... Uh, the tabs, I think you're you're really covering your bases with that. So that's what we do. But again, check out this article uh, in Outside as well. Yes, and we will link to that in the show notes. I would also say, I mean, he mentions here he's hoping to not have to find a gas station to refill water. Flip side, I will say, if I was doing 100 kilometer, kilometers on a rail trail and a gas station presented itself or was very close to the trail, personally, sure. I think I would probably just roll over there and get some, like, cold water and just enjoy that moment yeah did you, is that how you read it i read it as that they weren't available well he says as opposed to having to find a gas station to refill water so i mean i would just check the map maybe oh. before you go and just see like are is there any chance that you're going to pass anywhere that could yeah, have water just buy like an arizona iced tea every time you go by a gas station yeah yeah i mean i don't think that's going to be your answer for all of them and i mean you might what even... answer is arizona iced tea not true, true. yeah okay I mean, you might, he might also just be, you know, trying to kind of gear up for doing maybe a more unsupported trail run where there aren't gas stations available. But I mean, I would say if you can get cold water, get cold water. That's awesome. Sure. Yeah. So we'll link to that Katadin uh, handheld. Again, you're probably going to do some sort of handheld anyhow. So it doesn't really take up a ton of space. We use it, you know, as an extra bladder. I guess when we're using a, you know, hydration pack, we just jam it in the back and you know, or, or just hold it and pass it back and forth when we're running, uh, just so we get a little bit extra water for each stop uh, mm-hmm. is the way we've done it. Uh, so we'll link to that, and then we'll link to some of these tabs as well that we've used. And again, um, buyer beware and, and do what you got to do to keep yourself safe. And good luck. <laughs> that sounds awesome. Um, okay, next question. Um, actually, we have sort of like a, an amalgamation of questions here. You've been getting a lot lately, sort of as racing is coming back. I think people are 
you know, pretty excited about signing up for any and every race. You have people, you know, who are going back to sort of their Wednesday night races. You have people who are, you know, signing up as maybe some like soft preparation races, we'll say, like to get ready for their, their A race. Good idea to do a couple of prep races. And I guess a question that, you know, has been coming up more and more often is just like, do I, do I have to go hard during the race? Yeah. And I mean, this maybe comes up in a couple of different ways, like people trying to fit in extra races, or you mentioned the weekly race, like, you know, everyone wants to go to the weekly race, but then for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's coming up before their, their main race. So they want to still do it, but not go hard. Or, you know, there's sometimes it's just this idea of like going to the race, but trying to fit it in. And so I often use the phrase, you know, race, if you're going to race, like you don't go to a race and just not go hard. Like you don't give yourself an out. If you're going to race, then like part of the idea is that it's the most specific training in most cases that you can do. There's people, you know, you're getting pushed to your limit. There's probably some signs you're following. So it's a lot of the stuff we can't really mimic in training. So it doesn't really make sense to go to a race and try and do intervals or, or use a heart rate limit that's not relevant to the event, right? If you were doing a distance event, then maybe that's a good exercise. But in most cases, you race if you're going to race. Now, the flip side of that is that sometimes you just shouldn't race, right? And and that's difficult sometimes. Sometimes it means like you've signed up for a series and you're going to miss, you know, the, the week of the race. You're not going to do a weekly race because you're saving that start line energy and, and just energy for the race. So, And this is where that tip that I've given probably a billion times on this show, so people are probably sick of me hearing it, is if you have that weekly race situation or even like a weekend race, that's like your hometown race and you can't do it because your a race is the next week and you're trying to like not do these races, just show up and volunteer. Like you get to be part of the community. You get to see people, you know, it's a totally different way of seeing the event. It's, you know, really rewarding. It's fun. It gives back to the community. It keeps you in the mix. You don't get as much FOMO. I think even at that weekly race, right? Show up. Yeah. Yeah. And, and help with timing or tear down or something. Or you can even park a ways away from it and do your ride to the race and either like get a ride back to your car or just like show up at the race for like 15 minutes, say hi to people, do whatever, and then ride back if, if that ride fits into your schedule. Mm-hmm. Um, but just don't, yeah, don't tow the line unless you're actually going to give her on the on I think the that's, day. that's the idea. Yeah. And I think I'm more convinced of that. Uh, now i guess maybe then i would have been a few years ago um but yeah i think it's important that if you are getting to these events that you should use them and again the the flip of that is that we probably don't want to race all the time because we have to race if we race right so it's there's sort of the two sides of that coin but Mm -hmm. now we argued about this example ad nauseum as we were prepping for this episode. Yes, I'm still against it. So apologies if this just gets really heated here. But in my opinion, a great example of this was that, for example, Mariana Voss dropped out of the Giro Don after eight stages. It's a 10-day stage race. She was always planning on just doing these first eight stages and then not doing stage nine, not doing stage 10 as part of her Olympic prep. Like that was, you know, pre-planned she'd organized that with her team everyone knew that's what was happening and now could mariana voss have just soft pedaled stages nine and ten absolutely she could have she probably could have stayed with the peloton just soft pedaling because she's that freaking good but that would have been you know this extra time in this race situation that she didn't need if she's going to be as ready for the olympics as she wants to be So she went home. She, you know, went back to her training. She went back to her sleep schedule, her eating schedule, all of that stuff. Matthew Vanderpool did the same, like, in the tour. You know, he was doing great. He could have stayed with it, but that wasn't the plan. So he stopped. Mike Woods stopped the tour early to get ready for the Olympics. Um, You know, and Peter's debate was, you know, if they're going to do a stage race, they should do a stage race and finish. And that's, that's... I don't think that's what I said. It's an arguable point about pro racing, for sure. Uh, Just putting words in your mouth here. Yeah, that wasn't my point at all. But my point is, you know, these riders opted to, you know, end their race, you know, finish at stage eight instead of soft pedaling through the final two stages. Like, Voss could have still been in the points jersey. Yeah, I think the way you're trying to take this is that there's the goal was the goal. So in this case, it was stage wins in this whatever race, and then 
the Olympics or whatever take precedent. So they're skipping a couple stages. So this would be like the rest of us maybe skipping, despite the fact that we're winning the weekly world championships, you know, the, uh, the first five we did great. And then there's only two remaining and the last two are leading up, you know, they're ahead of this big A race you're doing. Right. Um, so it would be that you, you may have to skip that and let that go. You know, in Voss's case, maybe she could have won this tour. I don't know if she was in line she for She would that. not have won the tour, but she would have won the points jersey. So, I mean, sometimes it's, it, again, you can't do everything, right? And this is, especially as we're busy, you know, consummate athlete people, uh, you know, lives are busy. We only have so much energy, so much time. This, I think, is like a big game changer where it's, you know, you keep the goal of the goal and you show up for that. The day you said you were going to show up, you show up. And then the rest of the days, you, you're just very careful with how your energy and your time and time away from family gets spent, right? So I'm always nervous historically about these weekly races that are in the evening because it disrupts meal time. You know, if you're away from family. You maybe could have trained earlier and been home for dinner and then in bed in better time. Food isn't late. So there's a lot of these things that I feel like sometimes get a little wild. Again, you can do whatever you want to do. If those are important to you, do them. Race them if you're going to race them. Uh, but we just want to be careful. So I, I don't know. I think your example is fine. But how we were going to tie it back was where my confusion was. But I think we did okay. There you go. Um, and I think this also goes into uh, race day preparation. I think... You know, it's so we had the eight hour last weekend and it it was a casual event. Like it was not supposed to be a super racy event for either of us. I haven't raced a mountain bike in since the last eight hour last year and before that, like for 10 years. Uh, So, you know, I was not taking it super seriously as like a race to win. Um, But that said you know, we still prepared for it like it was a race that really mattered because every race really matters. And, you know, I talk about this in the Athlete's Guide to Sponsorship book that I have, like showing up to a race, like prepared with, you know, in the case of cycling, a bike that actually functions and doesn't need any major overhauls on race day, Uh, you know, clean kit, you know, extra kit if there's like potential for a podium, uh, a bag that doesn't have crap just like falling out of it, enough food and water that you're like self-sustainable. Uh, all of that stuff is just super important. And, you know, every race you should be doing that because it's, you know, not only is it just good form, it's also game playing for the actual race day. That's it. Yeah, the gameplay is, is what we're looking for. And this race, if you're going to race, then really encompasses this idea that when you race, it is the best chance to practice racing. So if you want to get better at racing, then you need to race, right? And we only get so many shots at this because the, as we said, the, the other side of the coin is that we, we can't race all the time. So you only get so many shots or so many times that you can practice, right? This is like kids playing ice hockey. You can only, or, you know, you can only access the arena at certain times, right? And so in the same sense, we can only race our bikes with people on a closed course, you know, that's, you know, as technical as you need it or whatever, in, in so many circumstances, right? And this differs, you know, probably the velodrome with track cycling is the best example of this is, is like, it's very hard to simulate most of the, those disciplines unless you have track time, right? So when you go to the track, you should probably race, um, you know, and get this, what, what does Jenny call that? Jenny True is a, one of our local track coaches and she calls it like deliberate uh, practice, it, not deliberate practice. She had another word for it, but that's the idea, right? Is that like your aggressive you're, play? Yeah. I don't know what she was, but that was her idea was that like, you need to use that time and it doesn't like even the weekly race example, like the nice thing about track that is her argument is that you get a lot of practices racing, but they need to be, you know, it doesn't matter if you lose. And, and that's the good thing about these weekly races and more frequent races, these practice races is it's not, it, it's not, you can try things, you can, you can lose, you can fail, you know, and, and learn from it uh, if you can be there and show up and be ready. And that's, you know, what Molly's talking about in these different books and in our book, Becoming Consummate Athlete, is being ready for these game plays with your gear, with your mindset, with your nutrition, so that you can really thrive and practice in those environments. Yes, and it should be noted during the eight hour, like I say casual, but like we were not really messing around at all. There was no stopping and chilling during the eight hours i think my heart rate was probably higher than it's been in a very long time like i used gels during the race like the gels that i know work well with my body like we were both 
We were both pretty in it, I'll say. Yeah, I mean, I think I think so. I think I had some fun laps thrown in there as well. It was eight hours after all, but uh, <laughs> you know, we were moving the whole time. Yeah, just just to say, like, I, I just wanted to caveat the casual, like, I feel like Herford Glassford casual is still uh, fairly. Intense. Why did you say casual? I did. Like the race was casual. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is sort of a casual race. I guess. I guess I see what you're saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, and then the the last one of like the the should I add time at the end of the race? And I think you get this one a lot when you're talking about those like weekly. Yeah, that's practices. probably the one of the top ways that I would say race if you're going to race. Uh, there's definitely again all these things have asterisks and exceptions. Like I, I've probably said it to someone. Uh, I've probably done it. But I think for most of us, we have to be careful that we're not devaluing the race. Again, race, if you're going to race, if you're planning on doing a four hour ride and you're trying to work on all that, like, are you thinking about the race? And then in the moment when it gets really hard in the race, are you putting in the 10 pedal strokes that you need to stay in the group? Or are you thinking about a four hour ride? I've often found that then this, you know, this is not going to apply to everyone, but most of the time when people like do that, to me, it's actually a very self-protective mechanism can be it can be there's exceptions exceptions yeah exceptions but i I think it does that and then i think the other thing that you know hopefully we're all hungry for coming back to racing yes the racing is 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 hard to simulate the other thing that's hard to simulate is the social element and i really miss that at races and so i think that's what i've seen too and i'm always a little i think more careful as i get older here as a coach is that people are thinking too much about you might you call it selfish maybe but you know, yourself and not about the social elements, right? Then we could call them networking if you wanted to be a little, you know, businessy with it. Uh, but you're trying to see people at these events, right? You might have sponsors. So, it, you know, there is a networking element to that. Uh, but you also might have friends, right? Or, or be trying to develop friends and reasons that you want to go to all these events. So I, I think that's where I want to be careful always with that, right? If you're going to race, race. If you want to train, stay home, save your money, train at an appropriate time, eat in your kitchen, you know, don't go to the race to train. Uh, again, there are asterisks. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So our next and last racing topic here is just nerves about returning to racing. Yeah. We've gotten a lot of questions about that. You know, for some people, racing has now been back for a couple months. For, you know, a lot of our listeners here in Canada, racing is sort of just coming back in some format or another. And I'm seeing with clients too, you're definitely seeing a little bit of, you know, everyone's on a spectrum and what's going on in their lives are very different. I think we are going to see some, you know, quote unquote, reopening anxiety, or I'm sure there's better phrases for it so i think you want to be careful like if you're actually struggling you know get help talk to people um you know reach out Uh, everyone's going to have their own on ramp to this right how fast they ramp back up to full you know life as it was or as it is well and i think that's the tricky thing is all of this is coming back all at once right like your kids are now back in soccer and hockey and all of their other activities you you might be back in the office or like seeing more like now you can actually see more clients like for for ontario for example we just opened up even more this past week and now restaurants have like greater capacity hair salons have greater capacity so that means the people working in those are going to be busier than ever like it's just going to it ramped right up mm-hmm. yeah, yeah so i'm definitely seeing that with you know time is not for a lot of people as as plentiful but the question is more how do we get back to racing and i think it's we were you know the same way you'd come into a season after you know being it being a snowy canadian winter or you know not racing for a bunch of months wherever you are in the world you know, ideally you have some C races, maybe these are weekly races coming back or, you know, we often have time trials more so even this year, there's a lot of time trials, which are nice in some ways because they don't have a mass start element to them. You're sort of doing your own thing. It's sort of like doing your training intervals, but now you're doing it with people on a closed course. And then, you know, the next step from that might be to add, you know, a mass start into that. So that can be a nice way. I always like that. We used to have a, a one just south of here uh, that was always the first one. And then we had this uh, more of a gravel race before gravel was gravel. That was again, sort of a mass start race. It was really crazy on the start, but it wasn't, you know, really quite still the actual type of racing. Like it wasn't mountain bike racing. Hang on. I have an aside about gravel. I've now, I'm working on an article about gravel racing and everyone I have talked to has utilized the phrase. I was riding gravel before gravel was gravel. Do you think there's anyone who will ever admit that they got into gravel 
when gravel became cool? I don't know. Probably. Just curious. Yeah, just just something it's... to ponder. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to keep racing. I'm, I've decided I'm going to race gravel on my mountain bike, though, and keep that alive. And then You've eventually gravel, gravel, that for... gravel will become mountain biking again. And then it'll be just like when I was 16. It'll be great. We'll have to get out your old CCM. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's what it'll go back to. Or you do have that old Gary Fisher. Yeah, okay. There yeah. we go. Yeah, I mean, I think you've been talking about racing Paris Lancaster on a mountain bike since I met you. Well, and I did. And you did. I was going to do it this year, too. But I did not get to. Next year. Next year. Anyhow, where were we? So I was describing races. So we're we're easing back into races. So I think if you're nervous, especially if you're just ready to go, like I have a few clients that can race any day. They're just great at racing, right? Some people are just, they're not great at training probably, but they're really good at racing. And, and that's, that is the paradigm. We have really good training people who get more nervous and actually don't like racing that much. I would say I'm in that boat. I'm pretty good at training. Racing I find harder to do. I have over the years become to value it as a test, as the social element, you know, getting the best out of myself by having other people around. But it's, it's I could definitely not do it. I think there's, there's also a broader spectrum. Because I was talking to a couple of the high-performance uh, youth from Ontario here last week, and they just had their first races at the Canada Cups. And I was asking, like, how were their nerves? And the the one young gentleman was telling me that uh, the morning of the race, they were all so nervous that they, like, could barely eat breakfast. They were just, like, just complete wrecks. And then they got to the race, still total wrecks, got to the start line, and as soon as they were on the start line – Boom. They were totally fine, revved, raring to go, excited. The nerves just like went away. So I think there's there's almost like the the way, you know, you just you're terrified the entire time, you're nervous the entire time. Then there's like the you're nervous until the gun goes off. There's the you're nervous until the start line. There's the you're nervous until the morning of. So, I think the other thing is figuring out like where it is that you where it is that your nerves go away. And knowing that that's, that's coming. So even if you're a little nervous, like in the morning, sure. knowing that by the start line, you're going to be fine. And I think, you know, th- th- what you're saying there is that you're going to be fine. Uh, in most cases, again, some people will need to get, you know, some support through this. Like it is a big deal <laughs> that we're coming out of. But, you know, there's this idea that most things in life that are important are, un- are you're uncomfortable, right? Uncomfortable, you know, discussions, you know, communicating, you know, saying the things that matter, you know, making the big move, you know, asking for what you need. All these things are, are a little nerve wracking, right? There's anxiety associated with it. Um, they're uncomfortable, right? And that's racing is you get comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I, I think that maybe is misleading because you pro- it probably always still hurts and you're probably always nervous on the start line, right? And, and we try and rechannel that to like you're excited about being on the start line, uh, and if you know because you care, you're nervous because you care. Some of these things, we're right? rephrasing it, reframing it can sometimes be helpful. But I think beyond that, so that's that's great. I think you know we're going to be nervous. It's because it matters. It's because we like it. We've prepared for it, and then trying to prepare for it by easing into, you know, training appropriately leading into it, and then trying to get some C races, some B races to again practice race if you're going to race. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yeah. Um, and again, we're coming back to that. Just like the more prep you can do, the better. So showing up at the race with everything dialed, double checking that you have all of your stuff, you know, d- triple checking that you have your shoes, your helmet, your chamois, all that fun stuff. If you're a cyclist, checklists, checklist work. Yes. I am a huge fan. We talk about it in the, in the becoming a consummate athlete book, like having that pre-race check, like packing checklist and having that pre-race, even having your own little like agenda that you make up. Um, that has sort of the, the two days prior to the race, the morning of the race, like that you can write out. Peter has every race he does. He has a notebook. He writes out, you know, the schedule of events, when we're leaving, when we're getting there, what warm up looks like, what time you need to be at the start line, not what time your race starts, what time you need to be at the start line. I think actually there's a lot of things that if we haven't raced in two years, we could very easily forget at this point, right? Like, like the fact that you get called up 10 minutes before your actual start time. Uh, like the fact that you have to pick up your number at the, you know, registration. Uh, like the fact that the porta potty lines are always going to be longer than you want them to be. Yeah, I'm pretty sure our clients had a porta potty issue and then also a staging issue where, like, they 
I think they missed their start, the one. Uh, and I don't recall why. I think that was actually a weird yes, now that I'm thinking. So I think their event organizer also hadn't done a race in a while, and there was like some miscommunication or rushing of the start process because I think it was a time trial start. So I think they were maybe rolling ahead of, the, uh, okay. which is dangerous, right? Because everyone's given an actual time of day that they're starting. So in any case, I think it's all going to be rough wherever you are and you're easing back into it, right? So give yourself some space, right? And that's been a note that I've been giving a lot of clients is just the first one, we're just, we're, com we're completing it, right? Our goal is to get through it. There might be some, you know, diversion, some things going wrong, uh, but we get through a couple and then we're back ready. So we complete before we compete. And that's sort of our, our catchphrase with that one, right? So race if you're going to race and complete before you compete. Yes, which are not mutually exclusive. Are mutually exclusive? Well, it depends. You and your Tour de France example. Uh, I know, of, I know. I've ruined it. Yeah, sort of throws it sideways on us there a little bit and the value of finishing what you start. But uh, there you go. There's exceptions to every rule. <laughs> All right. So with that, um, that's pretty much all we have for today. The last thing we'll mention is, of course, our awesome sponsor over at Inside Tracker. Uh, so, you know, whether you've been feeling great or whether you're feeling like something might be a little off, it's always worth kind of doing that little bit of detective work on, on yourself, on your body. You know, we always say doing things like HRV and, you know, filling in the comments on your training uh, every day and sort of just like taking your own you know, subjective and objective measures as much as you can. And if you want to dig a little bit deeper, even that's where something like inside tracker can be super awesome. Uh, they do uh, blood work and DNA testing and it's it can, in Canada and the U S yes, uh, which is great. Pair all of that with your like fitness tracking stuff. So they can kind of plug it all in and look at everything kind of in a really holistic way. Uh, I personally love the fact that uh, whether you're in Canada or in the U S they can do mobile blood draws. So if you want to talk about like, an easy way to get a ton of information about yourself without leaving the house. Uh, you know, someone shows up at your door, takes your blood, it's like vampire on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, then, you know, suddenly, boom, your, your info is all in this lovely like app with all of these recommendations that are personalized to, you know, what it is that you are looking to do. Yeah. And it definitely makes it easier. You know, I, I think general advice is that most people should be getting blood done yearly but, you know, for athletes, this this increases, right? And, and you can set the number on it, you know, two or three or four times, whichever. Probably depends how hard you're charging, right? If you're going for a full Ironman and also working, you know, busy lifestyle with family and so forth, this might be, you know, a little, a, a decent way to look just to make sure everything's rolling okay, right? And get a bit of a, you know, a red flag or a, a flag at least, maybe not red, but a yellow flag if you're, mm -hmm. you know, if you need to address something nutritionally or backing off of training or, or whatever, Yes, and as someone who's, you know, tried to get blood work requisitioned by a primary care physician in both the U.S. and Canada, like, I've had terrible luck with it. Um, and, you know, I've talked with Alan Noble about this. When you're sort of a, a healthy presenting individual, when everything looks pretty okay on paper, and you're like, yes, I'm running 70 miles a week, or whatever, like, they tend to not take you super seriously when you say you're not feeling great. Um, so I find, you know, being able to show up with blood work already done is super helpful for, you know, getting to the bottom of stuff. Um, and honestly, for some of us, that's just the only way we're going to get it done. And I've, I've run the numbers as far as in Canada goes. It's actually like pretty cost effective to use Inside Tracker versus going to like a naturopath or a doctor and, you know, paying for that appointment and, you know, getting the requisition for blood work and not having it covered by insurance. So especially if you're busy and can't get to the thing, right? Exactly. To the doctor, to the, to the lab. And then, and then at least, you know, right. It might be that everything looks good, but if it's like, Oh no, that's, you know, I've been feeling tired and there's blood work that seems off, then it's easier to go wherever you want to go, you know, the doctor and so forth. Exactly. And start looking into it. Right. Yeah. And the last thing I'll add on that is if, if everything does look good, great. Now you have a baseline for what, what is good for you. Right. And Maybe once you get into racing and traveling again or something like that. Yeah. You sort of know what you're, your baseline is so it's easier to, you know, figure out if there is something off. So you can check that out. Uh, we have links in the show notes, or you can head to insidetracker.com backslash consummate for 25% off everything in the store, which is an amazing deal. 
So highly, highly recommend doing that. Um, and we will be doing more of these Q&A episodes. So please hit us up if you have any questions, comments, topics you'd like us to tackle, even if it's not a super specific question. It's just like a topic that you're really interested in. Yeah, I think we'll do a mix of, you know, a, a spattering of questions that come in some days more like today and then maybe some days that are more like on a topic area. So if it's a topic area with a few sub questions, uh, we'll maybe accumulate them or you can suggest such a thing. Or, you know, if it's just a quick, quickish question, then we can add that to the the smattering episode. Yes, yes. So look for those. And of course, do a solid rate review and head over to consummateathlete.com for all the show notes. Thank you so much for tuning in and we will see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you enjoyed this or any of our past episodes, do us a solid and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts and check out our book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete over at consummateathlete.com. Questions or comments? Find us over on Instagram at consummateathlete and we will see you next week.